Okay, I think we're gonna start. Okay, we don't have a fancy trailer. Nevertheless, this is what's next. So this is, hello everyone. Good evening, good night, good morning in Australia. Uh, so this is a session uh, that is among the la latest one in the three day a global forum on democratizing work uh, to reflect on our recent experience and to project about the future. Hélène, if I may ask you to uh, mute yourself, that would be wonderful. So I am uh, Isabel Ferreras and I am joined by Ruth Human and Hélène Landmore. Uh, who are going to uh, launch this discussion, but the point is obviously to hear from you and to uh, discuss uh, together about our recent experience and our uh, take for the future. I wanted to first maybe share a few informations about a few facts about the forum, just so to share them with you so that uh, you um, are on the same page. And then uh, we will um, uh, hear from Hélène and then from Ruth. Um, we've been, um, we reached a total of 3,022 registered participants. So 3,000 was our upper uh, goal, upper limits, and uh, we made it. It's uh, really exciting that we made it, especially as we started um, publicity only 10 days before the event. We have uh, a lot of international coverage because these 3,000 participants are actually coming from 84 countries. The big countries are uh, the US, uh, Belgium, which is surprisingly a big country in, in this forum, Brazil, France, Canada, uh, these are the main uh, nationalities or origin of people uh, in terms of location. And um, I think uh, um, a few other significant facts. We've had um, uh, a 70 percent engagement of our participants, which means that uh, 70 percent of those who registered actually got involved in the event and on average stayed four hours and a half. These apparently are huge numbers. Uh, it uh, it's really speaks for how engaged uh, the, the participants are uh, because for online events, a standard rate is 30% uh, turnout. So we've been completely exploding that, um, uh, that record. Okay, so enough of that. No, I wanted also to say uh, this, and I will uh, copy it uh, in the in the chat. Um, yeah, let me put this in the chat. Oh, it doesn't look very nice. <laughs> Maybe I'm not going to put it in the chat. Um, well, why not? You will you will uh, you will enjoy it. Uh, so I wanted just to say that this uh, started um, not even 18 months ago with an op-ed which turned manifesto then turned global forum and so among the questions that we're going to think about it is what should come next. Uh, as you know in May 2020 we co-authored that op-ed with Julie Batilana and Dominique Meda. Um, Quickly, immediately, almost, we were a group of 13 female scholars behind the op-ed and uh, developing it into a book and joined by 7,000 signatories. The publication was massive in terms of uh, uh, newspapers. Uh, and then the book is now uh, translated in four languages. It's going to appear in English uh, in next spring at the University of Chicago Press. But more importantly, for the first anniversary, we decided to um, to do something about the, the manifesto as we felt we had to uh, be 
um, in charge of um, making a space, making space for it to be discussed. And um, uh, we set uh, this goal to organize the Global Forum for early October, because on this day, today, October 7th, it is the decent work uh, day across the world, uh, which is the day uh, that the International uh, uh, Confederation of uh, Unions have decided to uh, set for a decent work day. And um, and so in a few months, we organized this forum, which eventually, so which was a, a framework for you, for the signatories to get involved, to suggest papers, to suggest books to be discussed, to suggest panels. And we uh, eventually um, organized, set up a program of 127, 29 panels, I see in nine languages, uh, organized, via 16 national chapters and uh, as you see these are the numbers from this morning the 2900 we are now above 3000 attendees from 85 countries and uh, almost 400 speakers at those panels so these are the facts they are quite uh, impressive because we we are very we are the first to be surprised we are the first to be really enthusiastic about the energy uh, that drives this uh, op-ed turned manifesto turned movement, I guess. And so we have the great pleasure now to have Hélène Landemore, who is a professor of political science at the University of Yale, who is a member of that first core group, who is a co-author of the Manifest Travail, which uh, will appear as democratized work at the University of Chicago Press. And we also have the pleasure to have Ruth with us, who is, uh, um, sorry, who is a fellow uh, of Kellogg College at the University of Oxford and an associate professor of business ethics at Northumbria University in the UK, and who has been one of the uh, key participants in the organizing committee and scientific committee for the forum. So, I suggest we hear from Hélène and then Ruth uh, for um, between five and ten minutes uh, and then we'll open the conversation. So uh, Hélène, up to you. Thank you, Isabel. So first let me say how uh, proud and honored I am to conclude, help conclude this global forum on democratizing work. Uh, it's been an incredible event and uh, and I look forward to really the next steps. But for now, so what are the next steps and where do we go from here? And I was thinking about the here, and it could mean, you know, uh, the current state of the world. How do we move away from it towards something better? But it could also just mean this conference. And what, what do we do as a movement to, um, to, to go forward and onward, as Isabel always says? So let me answer, try to answer both questions, but focusing on the first one, really. Um, where do we go from the current state of the world? So I could give you many answers, but I'll just paint a picture for you um, with a thought experiment that I borrow uh, from a friend, Claudia Schwalis, who leads the OECD's work on innovative citizen participation and was on the panel that I chaired on the first day of this conference. So here's what she, how she describes her vision. I quote, imagine that you work for an organization with around 3,000 people alongside the appointed board members there sits a small group of employees chosen by lottery from across the organization to reflect the diversity of the organization's areas of work, geographical locations, and levels of seniority. It would reflect employees' diversity in terms of gender, age, and ethnicity. This group is involved is all, in all board meetings, receive all information that is also shared with the board, and have equal voting rights to board members. Every six months, one third of the employees is replaced by a new selection of employees, who are chosen by lottery. This rotation means that over, over time, a large number of employees will play a role in the organization's decision making. As these are extra responsibilities, people are remunerated for their time spent on these um, democratic activities, and ad any additional transportation costs or carrying costs are covered. The information that these lottery bodies of employees discuss related to budget, salaries, wages, working conditions, but also strategic decisions about partnerships and funding and clients and impact are all transparent for everyone at the organization to have access to this information. End of quote. Isn't that picture attractive? 
Does it not promise more fairness, better and more legitimate decision making, better employee morally, and all kinds of other goods, right? So you could picture uh, an organization like the OECD, which I think she had in mind, uh, my own university um, uh, of Yale, a, a hospital where nurses and you know uh, important workers often are not heard, and of course all the corporations we are familiar with, Exxon, Mobil, uh, Facebook, uh, you know uh, the healthcare industry, the the the, the food industry, all these um, places where we have now oligarchic power could be uh, democratized. Extend now this thought experiment, uh, as I said, imagining an economy of mostly democratic companies, small and big, um, themselves, of course, regulated and constrained by democratic laws that, you know, um, structure a fair market, protect the rights of workers and the environment. In this counterfactual world, would we really have to deal with CEO salaries up to 400 times that of the base salary? Would we have to deal to the same extent with data exploitation, attention farming, disinformation campaigns, but also frequent destructive oil spills, animal suffering and morbid obesity, opioid addiction and general harm to the planet. I think we know that it wouldn't be so bad. It, you know, it would be obviously better in, in many ways. So I see three directions we need to take in order to get to that vision of the world. Um, a first direction was suggested to me by yet another one of my panelists on that first day, uh, philosopher Olufemi Taiwo. He, we were discussing the fact that meetings take time and uh, you know, participating in decision making is, is complicated and time consuming. And he said something along the lines uh, of democracy is work, right? So democracy is not always fun and easy. Um, it's actual work, it's labor. So it takes energy, cognitive and emotional investment, care. So it's not something you can ask employees to do um, as a matter of course in their free time and in an unstructured way. Companies have to free time for this, invest in structures that facilitate democratic decision making and distribute the burden of democratic work equally. So you have to have a budget for it, competent people for it, think about, you know, plan, plan for it. Second direction is that as we seek to democratize the workplace, we need to be careful what we mean by democracy. In other words, we need to continue interrogating what uh, we mean by democracy and democratization beyond the abstract idea of giving power to people. Because the temptation is um, to give people voting rights, workers voting right, and hope for the best. But we see that in actual political democracies, that hasn't been enough. And in fact, our existing systems have evolved or degenerated into something closer to a plutocratic form of oligarchy than an actual democracy. So we, one thing we shouldn't do is replicate the mistakes we've already made in the political sphere. As I uh, you know, evoked in that vision of, of the future, um, and as I've also uh, uh, you know, researched in my own work, I think one path is lotocratic representation, selecting workers' representatives by lot rather than through elections, and combining this with participatory rights, allowing workers to put ideas on the agenda of the representative assembly and company-wide vote on key issues. That way you truly diffuse power, distribute it equally, and you avoid the blind spot that electoral representation tends to create. It also avoids uh, a natural problem if you start thinking of democracy as difficult work, which is the professionalization of the decision makers. If it's work, well, don't we need competent people who've developed a you know, an experience and a, and a professional sort of a competence, proficiency. Well, no, this idea should be resisted at all costs. Democratic work is something we all can and should be involved in, not necessarily always at once, uh, but uh, all at once, but in turn, in part because every worker, every stakeholder more generally, holds a relevant piece of knowledge of what, about what's best for the company as a, as a political and, and social um, uh, institution. The third direction is, in my view, logically, to democratize democracy where we already have it. Because neither democratic work or deco nor decommodifying um, labor nor decarbonizing our economy will succeed unless these actions are made possible by a set of structuring regulations and incentives that have to be legislated into existence at the national and international levels. So the strictly political, so to speak, remains quite central to our equation. 
And here my hope is with social movements from you know, Black Lives Matter to Me Too to Marches for Climate that are able to put pressures on government to do the things differently. And my hope is also with the so-called deliberative wave documented by the uh, recent OECD report, again led by Claudia Schwalis, which documents over 300 cases of deliberative mini publics meant to um, improve uh, our democracies uh, and augment them with the wisdom of um, ordinary assemblies of citizens. Um, I should mention that I find it inspiring that the day our global forum uh, launched, October 5, was also the day a global assembly on climate justice was convened, also virtually, bringing together 100 people selected at random from all over the planet to deliberate in the margin of the COP26 um, assembly that takes place in Glasgow. So far, this assembly is just a pilot, but it's meant to be a, a prelude to a much larger assembly of a thousand people gathered annually to put pressures on government around the world or on issues of climate change. This assembly has just received the support of Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General of the United Nations, who said of the assembly that it is a practical way of showing how we can accelerate action through solidarity and people power. So we are at the beginning of a paradigmatic shift. We are the paradigmatic shift. Um, it's just the beginning. Now, where do, last words, where do we go from here, meaning after this conference? We went, as Isabel said, from an op-ed to a book to a conference. I'd say, let's be ambitious, the next step should be a documentary, a film, or better still, a Netflix show documenting all the ways in which people around the world are already doing their part to democratize work, decommodify labor, and decarbonize the planet. Um, John Dewey, you know, thought that the difficulty in a democracy is for the public to find itself. All of us found ourselves, 3,000 people found each other. How do we build on that and attract more people? I think images, film, movies are a good way to bind us and, and, and connect us through language barriers. We should find a way to crowdfund this, um, not to depend on corporate donors, the way we've avoided depending on them for this conference, and hire excellent cinematographers and people to help us, you know, make such a show and pitch it to uh, you know, the relevant corporations. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Elaine. Now on to Ruth. Thank you very much. It's just been such a fantastic and fabulous three days. Uh, thank you very much for uh, giving me the opportunity to say something about this incredible experience that we've all enjoyed. I mean, the, the sheer energy of everybody communicating itself across uh, this platform has been amazing. And we've we've seen so much and learned so much from each other, haven't we? We've gone right around the world. We've visited so many different countries and and taken in all manner of different kinds of organizations. And it seems to me that they've represented just about every single aspect of human activity that you could possibly imagine from manufacturing to care to governing peoples to stewarding the land uh, but this this uh, roundup is about what what next and i think at the heart of it uh, it's the question is what is the change that we want to to bring about and I just wanted to say a little bit about change from my experience of working with organizations that have sought to, to democratize. And so at the, at the level of the organization, at the level of the individual worker who is becoming a, a democratized citizen, if you like, within the workplace, this is hard work change. It doesn't happen by accident. It happens with careful planning. It comes with forethought. It comes with determination by the managers of that organization to provide for and offer democ de democratized working practices to the workforce. And actually, this does entail a bit of a, a tension and a dilemma because we talked about hierarchies. We've talked about the need for a, a bottom up movement. But when we're talking about democratizing real organizations in the world, uh, and, and usually we're having to work with organizations that already exist out there and they're having to change themselves, then the managers of that organization often find themselves 
in the position of having to frame the new rules that the organization is going to operate under and helping the workforce to uh, achieve a new sense of identity, a new sense of empowerment, and a new sense of engagement with their work. And this is really a not insignificant undertaking. And any of you who are out there, and I'm sure there are lots of you that have been down this, have been down this pathway will know what I mean. In, in one of the organizations that uh, I, I worked with that was mutualizing, it was becoming a, a co-owned organization. Uh, I worked with a, a group of people in the organization who were the caretakers. This was a public service organization looking after housing stock, social housing stock. And uh, the caretakers of the organization were doing what we academics would call dirty work. This is work which is ignored, it's marginalized, um, it's, it's not taken for uh, granted, it's not, it's not really given a proper place within the organization, it's taken for granted. And it was this group of people that took up this change with the most, most high degree of enthusiasm and also an exceptional ability to move forward with that change and to see themselves as uh, newly democrat democratized citizens of the organization and there's a phrase which sticks in my mind which they said to me was the organization is seeking to care for its beneficiaries it's looking to care for those people who are going to be using the the, the houses that we look after and this is hard for the rest of the organization because they've not thought about care but we're the caretakers. This is easy for us. Care is what we do. And it was really inspirational hearing them talk about this. They used this core value of care as a way to open up democratic practices for themselves and their colleagues within their organization. And they became uh, the leaders of uh, the way in which the organization thought about its democracy and the way in which they spread it through their organization. And that's one organization, but I suppose that from that example, what I want to say to this conference is that change is hard work, but also that change has to come from perhaps quite unusual and unexpected places. So I think that one of the key tasks moving forward for us here is trying to find friends and allies in unusual and forgotten places. So that's not only those workers who were not seen as having the kinds of capabilities for becoming democratized citizens of the organization, but also those organizations that perhaps we, we might think are actually not on our side. Maybe we might say, actually, they're, they're quite capitalist organizations who are holding on to power, but we might need to seek them out and say, how are you going to undertake this change so that your organization can deliver a form of democracy to your workers and also to, to work out how that can benefit your customers, your service users, your investors and your communities. So I think that if we were to work on change as the idea of change being the work that we need to do, then that would help us to reach out to those parts of the economy that perhaps we've forgotten, and also to reach out to those organizations that have to make the, the largest and the longest journey, and to try to build the kinds of coalitions that are required so that we can show the politicians that we have something to offer. Because in the end, a lot of this is going to have to come down to reshaping the regulatory and the legal framework. And we need to bring really powerful examples to those politicians if they're going to make that change. And I think if we are to, if we, if we do our very best to find the workers who are out there who are undergoing this change and who can demonstrate the kinds of new identities that they have had to forge in order to become democratic citizens of the organization. And then if we combine that with a search for organizations that are also trying to make that change, then we will have quite a powerful network 
uh, of examples that we can draw upon in order to persuade the politicians to come on our side and make the change that is needed in the regulatory frameworks. Thank you very much, Ruth. Thank you uh, to both of you for having articulated your take and your uh, vision for the next steps. I want not to suggest that other members of the uh, scientific committee uh, join us on the on the panel, and uh, we are going to uh, take questions from the Q and A. But uh, so if if Pavlina, if Lisa, if Imge, uh, and 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 you know whom uh, wants to join us, please uh, do. Hello, Pavlina. So. I suggest we we take the questions, but then so we'll turn uh, to to respond to respond to them, and we'll see who who wants to take them. Uh, there was a first question about uh, encouraging encour encouraging emergent chair shared leadership. Um, so, what about encouraging emergent shared leadership? So, those who step up organically can step into shared leadership roles. Also, democratizing work may need self-development beyond social conditioning. I let that uh, rest so that we can see uh, who wants uh, want to address it. Uh, Marmo's work is congruent with the manifesto. Could explicit linking of health, 90% socially determined, be I guess I don't see well the okay with this inspirational movement facilitate grassroots solidarity in pressuring governments. I've seen Michael uh, uh, making that connection already in other panels. The connection, obviously, between uh, work and uh, decent and meaningful work and uh, health. Um, uh, this is an important connection, uh, obviously. Um, should I ask you uh, on the screen to 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 um, share your thoughts about maybe what uh, Elaine and Ruth said, maybe about this uh, these two these two questions that are raised, but probably most importantly about your own experience during those uh, three days and what you think we should do next? Maybe Lisa to start. Thank you. Yeah, no, those were incredible three days. I'm at the same time super enthusiastic and super exhausted, like many of us, if I look into your faces. Um, I think we really should continue the work on getting out, getting the word out about these alternatives that are there. I love the idea of a movie. I was once in touch with a movie maker about new work, new money, new all these new things didn't get funded at the time, but maybe with crowdfunding, we could manage this. I have, well, I have lots of ideas, but let me put forward one, one proposal. I think lots of the challenges are really different in the different countries. And we've heard the different stories from India, from Brazil, from various European countries, US, Canada. So one way forward could be for all the national chapters to make a plan what they will do in the next 12 months and to commit to, for example, trying to find companies with which to work, um, writing letters to parliamentarians, deciding what steps make sense in their concrete context, what to push for, and then to share the experiences, use the network to get expertise from other countries, to, for example, invite speakers over, um, to, to, to really adapt the strategies to the different national contexts, because we need to be both global and local. It's the, the kinds of problems that we are facing are that that kind where it needs to start locally and we need to keep the, the global vision. And, and so I think involving the national chapters in, in some such way to be figured out in detail could be another strategy for moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Pavlina, Imge? Imge, maybe, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Isabel. So it was amazing, uh, three days full of uh, can you hear me clearly? 
or is there yeah. a problem? Yeah, okay. Now we can hear amazing. some uh, background noise. I'm very sorry. So <laughs> uh, it was amazing two days, full of energy, good vibes, and um, solidarity. I can say I really second Lisa's thoughts. So um, it it will be really good to um, have national chapters making their own plans uh to for the next 12 months and maybe having another meetup all together to discuss what can be done globally and what they want to uh, make locally uh, this would be amazing so we need to activate them and i don't want to take more time but i really want to reiterate especially what was the key message in the panel that i chaired so solidarity cooperation voice and acting together these are amazing uh, uh, things to, to democratize, decommodify, and decarbonize work. And uh, uh, I just want to say, everyone, that we are uh, waiting for you to get involved. It is not late. So if you haven't done so, please let us know. Uh, please get engaged, and uh, we can work together uh, for the future of the moment. moment. Thank you, Imgi. And Pavlina? Yes, uh, I was just reflecting on what a whirlwind this has been for us as a group. Uh, you know, we've known of each other's work, but many of us hadn't actually met in person. And so just launching this project and how quickly it just galvanized so much support has been so inspiring. And this conference was just another testament to that. And so in a way, we have ourselves experienced what uh, uh, this this kind of uh, exercise in democracy is um, to join together to do things um, that uh, we you know just to expand our horizons and our contacts and our just work. I know my work has benefited greatly from this collaboration and from then connecting to the people who attended here. So a couple of things that um, resonated with me, and I'm thinking about next steps. You know, I tend to be impatient. And so my first thought is like, we just have to go and talk to the policymakers. And so like, there's just one thing that I think that we, we need to be doing is, is that engage them, continue to engage them. Um, and in my session yesterday on the job guarantee in unions, you know, we asked, you know, a representative Watson Coleman, you know, what can we do concrete steps? And she said, bother us, bother us, uh, you know, just pick up the phone and just, don't give up and talk to the representatives. And I, you know, I particularly am inspired by Sarah Nelson's strategy because she has such a good way of communicating to her union members, like what's happening on the Hill, little snippets of, of, of um, just um, articulating problems, challenges, what that, that means to the constituencies, to the people, and how they can just pick up the phone call and what to do. So that's one of the strategies that I feel you know, uh, whoever is listening and has the year of some policymaker to just introduce these ideas, but also as we do that, to not um, accept false narratives. Another theme that came through in our conversations is that there are just so many disempowering strategies, like uh, narratives. Oh, oh, we just can't afford this. Oh, the government can't really create jobs. Oh, technology is inevitable and job loss is inevitable. Oh, the climate is already here. And it's just, we just have to live with it. And I feel that there are way too many no's that we have, uh, that we hear. And everything I heard from the panels on this, uh, on this platform was yes, that we want something else and that we can, uh, have a different future. It is not given to us from above. It's a, a future of our own making. So that would be the second, the second lesson that to take away. You know, don't accept a false narrative when it when it feels wrong, even in your normal conversations with people, and then of course with policymakers. Um, but then uh, the last point was um, seek friends in unusual places that Ruth mentioned. Um, you know, I've experienced this in my own work on modern monetary theory, where it, I, I know the contribution that people have made who came outside of academia, how some ideas resonated with, with them and their own work. 
and how they came from different places, whether it's from activism, whether it's from art, whether it is from law, uh, some from academia, others not, but somehow they found a common understanding and it created a fellowship that I didn't quite really expect when we began the scholarly work. And, and then uh, the issue is that you, we can't, you know, that we do need culture creators and the people who offer the new narratives. And they are not just, you know, economists or, you know, sociologists and philosophers, but they're also the people who create art and images. And so, yes, I do love the, the Netflix idea in the movie uh, because there are other ways in which we kind of um, uh, spread the messages that stick. And so uh, these are just my just preliminary thoughts, but I've been incredibly energized uh, to be part of this project. Great, thank you. Um, I see a reaction in the Q&A uh, from Gregor Chapelle, who uh, is enthusiastic with Hélène's ID too, but crowdfunding uh, a monthly subscription for a democratizing work movie. Uh, indeed, that crowdfunding our efforts would be very aligned, and I think that makes full sense. Um, and we have already inquired a bit in that direction and it could be easily done indeed uh, maybe before Hélène, before turning to you uh, i guess i would i would like to just highlight the fact that indeed i felt also that the the energy during those three days maybe Hélène, if you can uh, uh, turn off the microphone please uh, the energy during the three days was extremely positive and I guess that's something that is quite unique because uh, I think people are have been here because of the urgency of uh, the time. They are very concerned. Uh, if you're not concerned about the fate of uh, the world, you are not thinking about democratizing and decarbonizing, uh, but uh, and decommodifying, but. Uh, but they are hopeful and indeed that sense of um, um, hope that there is another path for economic development that can be that can fit the democratic project and that can, that can meet planetary boundaries and respect the needs of other uh, living beings on this planet is really uh, a, a huge source of positive energy uh, and so the the um, the combining this this hope and this sense of energy with um, practical proposals, policy proposals, actual things that could be done concretely, uh, is uh, I guess a big a big driver that we should continue to harness because uh, at least as a as an academic, I feel. A responsibility not to let that down and it's as Hélène said I mean John Dewey said the role of uh, wrote the, about the role of, of scientists to help the public to identify its own problems so that in the end the public can take its own problems into his hands and here we are I think indeed uh, this is a good description of what we are doing we're trying to put these resources, these intellectual resources in terms of framing of the problems into the public realm uh, to mobilize the various constituencies which are affected, which are concerned, which are uh, which have a responsibility, if we think about the, the elected officials, to take those problems into their hands and to make their to make them their own problems. Um, so let me turn uh, back to Hélène uh, and then maybe please uh, do do write in the in could be not in the Q&A you can write also in the chat uh, especially members of national chapters coordinators please also uh, uh, give back your uh, your experience about the three days this is not very uh, ideal as a setting uh, it would be much better on a Zoom where we can all, uh, you know, interact. Uh, but I can certainly uh, sum, sum 
if some wants to come up, we can maybe uh, may maybe do that. So uh, feel free to 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 voice uh, your your views. But Hélène? Yes, I just wanted to answer one of the questions. Uh, what about encouraging emergent shared leadership so those who step up organically can step into shared leadership roles? And I wasn't sure whether the question was about the organization of the movement or about the workplace uh, specifically, but I think I just wanted to, to raise a point that I think applies to both contexts, actually, which is that, yes, it's wonderful to encourage uh, you know, people who naturally step into the role of leaders. But at the same time, I think it's important to create opportunities for people who don't see themselves as natural leaders. And that, that's why I like random selection over self-selection in general, because in the political world, we know that self-selection will tend to, you know, get you more of the same. The people with, uh, you know, either the connections or the background or the education to step into leadership positions. And, you know, it will tend to skew male, white, wealthy, educated. And it's really important to go to the, the margin and the periphery of these groups and, and, and go for the people who actually do, do not see themselves as leaders, but actually have a lot to contribute and, and not coerce them into you know, occupying a, a role of leadership. So at some point they'll have to accept the burden or the responsibility or want it. So there will be a, a moment of self-selection, but really create that space for them, that vision for themselves. And, and, um, and, and you'd be surprised by how people step to the step up to the occasion in, in the context of citizens' assemblies, for example. Uh, people who were disillusioned about politics, um, were randomly selected, accepted, almost refused, came to the first day of the Convention for Climate, for example, in France that took place last year. And this guy, you know, that I'm thinking of, um, had his suitcase, this, this like little, you know, uh, suitcase following him around all day because he knew he was going to leave. He was going to leave. Seven weekends later, an entire year later, he was still there you know, completely uh, transformed by the experience. And so I think, yes, to, you know, cultivating organically sort of uh, emerging um, leadership, but also sort of creating opportunities for people who are not organically natural leaders. Ruth, yes. Uh, this this um, concept of leadership is actually extremely important. And uh, one way to think about the kind of leadership that is appropriate for a democratizing organization is to think about leadership as distributed. So each member of the organization is prepared for the leadership that they will take up according to the problems that might arise within the organization that the, that the organization has to solve. So it becomes a kind of generalized capability of each person within the organization and they are trained up for it, it's systematized, it's managed, and they are equipped with the resources and the skills that they need in order to take up leadership when they're called upon to do it. So distributing the capabilities, the capacities and the resources for leadership through the organization is is a feature i think of quite a lot of democratized organization but there's an aspect of leadership which we've not mentioned which is leadership across the boundary of the organization into say supply chains into sectors into organizations that have to work together in order to solve problems which no organization can solve alone and this really, I think, does highlight an aspect of democratization that we could look at in our, in, our, in our next phase of development, which is democratization across those boundaries uh, in sectors and ecosystems of organizations that have to work together. And we've seen that during the course of the pandemic, you know, um, uh, supermarkets, healthcare organizations, uh, other kinds of provisioning uh, organizations delivering essential services have had to work together. Uh, they've had to suspend normal competitive arrangements in order to um, you know, get the job done and to secure uh, the goods and services that are critical for people. So I think there's leadership, which is across the boundaries, and there's democratization across the boundaries 
but that uh, how that how that is built up is from within the firm where each person feels themselves confident to be a leader when they're called upon to take up that role in order to solve whatever problem is at hand. What's brilliant with uh, what Ruth said is that it it speaks as much to the stakes of democratizing work in the firm than to the the way we we can um, envision the next steps of our organization as a movement or as a as a yeah as an organization. So this is meaningful at those two levels. Uh, maybe let, let me uh, react with three points and then Pavlina. Uh, I um, I think uh, your point, Ruth, is is extremely well taken about uh, reaching out across the boundaries, and I I think we have made a significant step with the global forum because that was our first attempt at precisely trying uh, that, and uh, not to be just a group of academic, but to really reach out beyond the beyond academia and engage with the. The constituencies that are are more most concerned with uh, the problem of of work, and uh, and I think we've been fairly successful uh, in the sense that we could in many countries engage political uh, leaders who came to the forum, who spoke to the forum. We could engage with uh, journalists, uh, which uh, who were also a constituency that we had identified. Obviously, union leaders. Obviously, progressive business leaders in the cooperative um, uh, sector, in particular. Uh, so, in all those uh, climate activists, so all those constituencies that we had identified as relevant across uh, our like small core, uh, I think have been. We've made a first attempt, but it's clearly not enough. And if if we want to be true to the, the responsibility that we have vis-à-vis uh, -vis those, three, those three principles, we certainly have to do much more and better. I hope that they will have enjoyed their participation and that it was sort of meaningful to them and so that they want to, to come back or to continue that conversation. So uh, from that perspective, I think that uh, engaging into some sort of uh, um, ongoing conversation uh, across time. I love the idea of Lisa saying, you know, in planning for a year, but could, could we imagine, for instance, that uh, we would uh, set um, a monthly meeting at a regular, you know, point in time, I don't know, every first Monday of the month or whatever time, uh, at a time like similar to the, the plenary session so that people across time zones can join, where we would meet around the three principles, but carry like um, organize a, um, according to a format uh, that one or two national chapter would take into, uh, into their hands, would set up the program for that day and would seek to engage these various constituencies to look at the three principles in action. Because I think also what was very clear from those three days is that people want to, to see how to move forward with them in reality. So they are not interested in two academic um, seminars about democracy and political theory, that we have other spaces to do that. But in uh, as as such, um, the global forum in its outcome could be this sort of permanent conversation uh, um, organized in this micro macro you know dialogue. If we if we identify national chapters who wants to go first and who wants to organize this, uh, that could be very rooted. But at the same time, we would all gather to hear from them and so to to reflect on those issues in a rooted way, but in a global perspective. So this is this is only um, an idea. So Pavlina, and then I'm going to check the Q&A because I see their reactions. Yeah, I, um, 
I don't want to shift the gears too much, but um, I want to acknowledge the comment by Guy Town in the chat, uh, where he says that he feels there's a critical mass of cities engaged in advocacy for a job guarantee experimenting for real with a concrete proposal to perhaps do a workshop on cities democratizing work through a job guarantee. Uh, and uh, I'm very happy to, to speak with you about that. Um, uh, offshoot uh, if we want to do something like that um, uh, in the context of the global forum. But it made me think about another, um, just another comment that that was made yesterday. Um, first, there were there was, you know, in the spirit of the 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 manifesto, there were so many um, speakers who engaged with how the job guarantee facilitated the green transition, how it facilitated the civil rights, it facilitated um the uh, it was a signature demand for the civil rights it's just, it helps organizing union organizing democratizing um within the firm and one speaker the, the historian david stein from ucla said what do we need to do now better than we did during the new deal or the civil rights to make sure that these ideas that are not they're not new they're old ideas stick and that we don't lit litigate the old the old sort of debates and we don't water down our mission and our proposals that we succeed where uh, we didn't in the past. And I, I think that this is really the way to go forward, Gaetan, by really galvanizing the global efforts, that this is not, you know, a US-based conversation and it's not a conversation somewhere in uh, the zero long-term areas in France that you know, and bringing in Jean Dresse with uh, real world experience of a very large scale program, learning from those experiences the West doesn't know about. Um, it really shows us how our work is very much connected. And so it is, I think it is a matter of, of uh, finding each other once again. And I, I'd be happy to work along this, this dimension, of course. Um, and David Stein said, we just have to be better. This time we just have to be better, and I feel that the international uh, movement is one way to be better. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. Yes, absolutely. Now I think so. Thank you for the the comments, contributions. It's much more than comments put also in the in the Q and A. I think. Um, uh, uh, these are really excellent suggestions or propositions. Um, so um, I think uh, what we are going to do in terms of timeline, so because we have to come to a closing for this conversation uh, today, is that we're going to have a meeting with the, the organizing committee uh, to debrief and assess uh, the, the global forum that will be early uh, November, end of October, early November, and all the signatories are going to be invited to uh, a big Zoom call as we've done in the past for uh, December 1st. Uh, and um, these two steps will uh, enable us to then sort of plan for the future. But so please be in touch. We will be specifically in touch with the coordinators of the 16 national chapters but if you are not part of any of those and wants to be involved please be in touch with us okay you know where uh, how to to reach us um i wanted before we stop to close with some uh thanks so i want to have the time for that uh, and so um if there are not any more burning questions I don't see any, and I see Julie now has managed to to be with us. Uh, so she's she's listening certainly. That's great, Julie. Uh, oh yes, she 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 was uh, putting something in the chat. So organizing some events throughout the year that bring together practitioners across the sectors, academics, researchers across disciplines, policymakers is an exciting idea. I agree though that we have to make sure that these gatherings will be helpful to all the participants and enable to move things forward on the three principles. Great, that's wonderful. So I think we'll, we'll find easy ways to, um, to get uh, quite aligned 
with some uh, excitement around the idea of the documentary. You might have missed that, Julie, so we'll fully update you about that. Um, so, um, yes, so let's let's take the time, as Gaetan uh, suggests now, to uh, acknowledge uh, our uh, great gratitude to many uh, different persons. So first, uh, we wanted, and I'm going to, I'm going to copy uh, their names in the chat to acknowledge uh, all the fantastic, fantastic volunteers who have made possible this event. So it's been a crazy work by uh, all these persons who are many of them PhD students who work with us, but other uh, volunteers uh, who've been uh, former students, who've been uh, technically moderating all those panels because the, the technicality behind this was not so easy. Now, after three days, we feel like we've been trained a bit, but um, it's, it was something. So thank you to all of them, Jordan, Alaya, and sophie Bouvi, Joe Gar Barcia, Liana Byler, Dylan Carslow, Irina Chobanu, I'm sorry if I don't uh, say this correctly, Elliot Cobo, Marit de Jong, Samuel Desguin, Judith Fabra Mestre, Conrad French, Olivier Jégou, Jordan, Jordan Jenkins, Marie Jocelyne Kanzari, Leshek Kroll, Alexander Kruger, Judith Kranowski, Zara Massoud, Oslem Mertel, Billy O'Connor, Ryan Hoffman, Pablo Pastor, Jack Pleasant, Valérie Anquadbon, Justeriano Zamora, Arunima Sirkar, Selina Scrotel, Eli Chaprio, Camille Ascola, Yusel Touregun, Paola Toro, Alex Ubalic Rojo, et Joseph Vassen. Really, thank you so much to all of them. You recognize, yes, many of you recognize your own students. They've been fantastic and really working behind the 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 screen and uh, and um yeah so we we haven't seen them but we we did as as speakers but so thank you to all of them they really made that event possible um now we have other uh people also to thank it's all the coordinators at the national chapter level here we have a lot of people uh, let me, uh, and obviously this chat <laughs> is not very friendly because I cannot post everyone at the same time. So we have chapters for uh, 16 countries and I'm going to paste them first. Um, and then we can take the time to review all of them because really they deserve a full acknowledgement. Can you imagine the day we'll have uh, not 16, but 94 national chapters as the the countries represented today. By the time so, Hopton will offer us a special chat version where you can paste them all. <laughs> yeah, by the time indeed Hopin will have we yeah that that will be a good request from our end. So uh is there some yes from so I need to move up. So in Belgium, Julien Charles, Frédéric Dufay, Martin Hermans, Valeria Puligiano in Brazil Sayonara Grillo Coutinho, Flavia Maximo, Juliana Texeira Esteves, Maria Cecilia Teodoro Maximo. In Canada, Gregor Murray. In Chile, Rodolfo Martini Clenta y Sebastián Pérez Sepulveda. In Costa Rica, Mauricio Gutiérrez. In France, Jamila Alactif, Roberto Frega y Philippe Lorino. In Germany, Rael Yagi, Lea Prix, Christian Schmidt. In India, Amita Behar, Nira Shandoki, 
Ravin Priyadarshi, Salman Sos, Sidars Vardaranyan, Vidou Verma. In Italy, Paolo Borghi, Guido Cavalca, Cara Faini, Emanuele Leonardi, Rosa Fioravante, Francesca Martinelli, who's with us, I saw, Marco Marone. Thank you, it's a very strong Italian chapter, I must say. The Netherlands, Bjorn Bihal Halder, Vladimir Boguski, Max Visser, and Lisa Herzog behind them, <laughs> Peru, Gianfranco Casuso, Philippine, Charmila Parmanant, Portugal, Anibal Lopez, Joana Castro e Casto, Slovakia, Petr Me Meziorak, Spain, Sara La Fuente, Turkey, Goce Basbuk, Kivanch Eliasik, Ezin Ileri, Selin Pelek, with him, Gay, with them, USA, Pavlina, obviously, Kyle Moore. Um, and so these are, this is the tip of the iceberg. Uh, but it's a very strong tip because you you made that amazing program possible with uh, some other people uh, that uh, we're not going to mention, but in every country. Thank you so much to all of you in those 16 countries to have uh, made for such a strong program, which was really amazing. And now we uh, are going to say thank you, thank you for the amazing team coordinating this conference. Obviously, there is the conference manager, Alicia Pastori Camarasa, who is sleeping at last because she's in New Zealand and this is very late in New Zealand. It's almost she's going to start her day. Uh, Alicia has been amazing. She's been really working through the summer to make it possible. With the help of Camille Genan, who've started the first to scout for this platform. Thank you, Camille. You've been amazing throughout. Alejandra also. Alejandra is sort of, I don't know if she's with us. Uh, she's in the, in the office next door as Camille. In, in the back, but so Alejandra has been also just fantastic uh, to help us in uh, the three languages also in Spanish, French and, and English. We had uh, amazing help uh, from uh, some of the um, graduate students uh, who've been involved, uh, like uh, Kyle Moore, whom I already mentioned for the USA, but Kyle has been amazing uh, also taking over when Alicia was sleeping those last three days. It's been so uh, fantastic. And I'm sorry, I might uh, forgot some names, but we'll make sure they, they're, they're, they are going to appear in the last version of the program. So we're going to update the program so that we can really pay tribute to all of you who have been so uh indispensable really to the organization and the good proceeding of the conference even though we we had some hiccups with the the platform but overall it went it went quite well i think so thank you so much it's been uh joey yes obviously it's joey thank you pavlina that i was that i forgot joey has been fantastic and i should not have forgotten yes amazing uh, support from Zoe who manage all those uh, high level panel and um, and thank you Hélène for your support also um, so I think we can we can stop here uh, congratulate ourselves probably no right? sorry stop we need to thank Isabel <laughs> yeah. yes I was going to Say something. Oh, oh yes, Ellen, that's right. You said you wanted to say something at the end. Okay, this is we are over time, so you don't have to say a minute so i just wanted to really acknowledge you know first of all the three women behind the whole endeavor initially julie batilana isabel ferras and Dominique Mira. obviously you guys brought us together you penned the op-ed you spelled the core group to write a book you orchestrated the organization of this global conference the first of this kind it's absolutely remarkable. And I want to acknowledge you, Isabel, in particular. I met Isabel in 2003 at Harvard University at the end of a seminar 
on global justice stood by Amartya Sen, Josh Fakoyan, and Tim Scanlon. It's probably one of potentially the most important encounter I've met there. I remember very vividly that Me encounter too. and how we ended up at Pete's Coffee discussing our research, including your study of justice in the workplace, uh, Belgian cashiers, and economic bicameralism. And it is truly beautiful and moving to see the mountains um, you have moved since then in the last 20 years or so to make what seemed like incredibly utopian ideas back, you know, back in the days into the driving inspiration of a global movement. So really Thank kudos you. To, to you. Isabel. Thank you, Helen. That's very generous. But I really feel that this would not be possible without us. This is really the interconnection that makes it possible. But thank you very much. And I'm so I'm so happy to be part of this amazing group of people and women in particular. Thank you. So I, we'll see each other very soon. It's difficult to, after having spent all this time <laughs> on hopping, it's difficult to, um, to, to close. But yes, thank you. Thank you for the comments in the chat. Flavia, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Julie. So, so good you could uh, join at the end. And um, yeah, onward and upward. <laughs>